Well, I know there's already a million YouTube videos on photographing and editing Comet Neowise, but I thought I'd throw my hat in the ring and show you guys how I created this image tonight. It's about 1 a.m., but before I go to bed, I wanted to give you one more tutorial today. So what we're going to do is go through my full process, and I'll show you how I got this image. First, we're going to head over to Adobe Bridge, and we'll get started. Now, if you want to photograph this, at this point, pretty much go out right after sunset, look in the northwest sky below the Big Dipper, and you will see the comet. So I'm just actually going to open up all these, give you an idea. And here we have some photos taken a little bit after sunset, just when the stars were coming up. You could barely see this with the naked eye. The problem was all that ambient light was washing out the finer details in the comet. And this is one of the nice things about the next few nights, the comet will be up in the middle of the night. That means there's no light pollution from the moon or the sun, obviously. So you're going to be able to get a lot more detail. And I think this is a great way to really show the tail if I edit the image a little bit. It's very grainy, but you can still get the idea. So there we go. There's uh, a 10 second shot of the comet. But this is why I'm so adamant about using a star tracker. Because look what happens. If I zoom in, see how splotchy this is? There's like green and purples and blues. It doesn't look very good. And overall, it's just not the best photo. I mean, it's cool to see the big tail and everything. But there's a much better way to do things. If you have a star tracker, which is one of the reasons I'm so adamant about them. So what I did is once it actually got dark, I started taking two minute long photos, F4, 110 millimeters, at ISO 400. And let me put everything back to start so you can see what it actually looked like. There we go. So that's what the raw photos are looking like from the back of my camera. And these were taken again using a star tracker. That way after two minutes at 110 millimeters, I still had pinpoint sharp stars. And the comet, all things considered, didn't really blur out compared to the 10 second long photo which we saw here. There's no noticeable difference in terms of definition between that 10 minute shot and the two minute shot, as far as I can tell. So with the help of a star tracker, now I can really start to take this to a whole nother level. And what I did originally is bring up the exposure until I could see both of the tails. We got that nice one there and there. From here, I'll bring down the highlights to preserve detail in the core. Maybe bring down the blacks a little bit, add some contrast, bring up the whites a little bit, just to give the image a bit of a kick. Once I've done that, I can scroll down. And by default, your sharpening here in Camera Raw is going to be about 40, I believe. So if you were to zoom in, even at two minutes, it might be a little bit uh, grainy. So if you lower the sharpening here on your detail tab from 40 to zero, that will help to smooth things out a little bit. You could also increase the noise reduction. This is one of the best ways to do it. It's very easy and effective. Just don't go overboard here because if you do, you're going to get artifacts. Although that doesn't look terrible right there. But normally I leave this fairly low around 10 to 15 just to make the grain a little bit softer. It's already looking a lot better. Now what I want to do is get rid of this vignette, which is very annoying with this particular lens just because it's kind of a pain to remove. And I didn't take any flat frames, but if I come here to the optics tab and click use profile corrections, it's automatically going to remove, sorry about that, the distortion and the vignetting, which you can see down here. Now I don't like the distortion fix because if anything that might cause artifacts once we do our photo stacking. So I'd recommend if you're ever doing this, especially with star trails, never apply the distortion correction. Turn that from 100 to zero because it's only going to cause problems. The vignetting though, you can leave that at hundred. So here's no vignette correction. If you look at the corners and after, see how much better that looks. You can even go above 100, but you just got to watch out. This is again why people recommend taking flat frames because it'll actually perfectly map out the vignette if you do things correctly. Whereas this way is kind of a more uh, general process, but it still works fairly well. There's our before and after. I think they did a nice job anyway. 
And I can always add a vignette back if I'd like later on. Now that they fixed the vignette, the exposure, the contrast and everything, that's a good starting point for the rest of our workflow. And don't worry about the plane. With this workflow today, I'm gonna to show you how to just get rid of it without even having to deal with it, really. Uh, the last thing to fix though, is the white balance. You don't wanna leave this on as shot. Because in my case, I had this on an auto white balance, which meant that it changed between every single photo. So what you always wanna do is come here and put the white balance to anything other than I have shot. So around 4,000 degrees Kelvin, tint of zero, I think it looks really nice. We're starting to get some of that blue color. Although you could argue it's a little bit too blue right now, but I'll live with it. All right, so this was just a single two minute long photo. But as you see here, I took probably two or three dozen photos one after the other using my camera's built-in intervalometer. So I had it on like a two minute and three second interval, which means it took a two minute photo, there's a three second gap, took another two minute photo, and I just kept going and going for about an hour. Now, once I have all these images, I'm gonna hold down the shift key. That way they're all selected. And if you hit this little button with the lines, or you could just right click and hit sync settings. And if you did that correctly, it's gonna apply your edits from the first photo to all the rest. And you'll notice that there's a, a lot more green here. That's from the air glow, which is just a natural phenomenon that goes on throughout the night. It's constantly moving. Well, there's a satellite, I think, there. But there we go. So I've gotten, I don't know how many, 20 or so TIFF files, or rather, RAW files that I've edited. Now I need to save these all as high quality TIFFs so I can stack them together. So what you wanna do again is hold down the Shift key and click. Now that all of our photos are selected that we wanna work on, I'm gonna right click, save image, save image. I don't know why they don't change the terminology to save images, considering I have a bunch selected. But then again, they completely ruin this interface as far as I'm concerned, so it's not surprising. All right, once you're in your save options window, make sure you're saving this as a TIFF file, that way it's lossless, you're not gonna lose any data. Down here where it says color space, I recommend using sRGB if you don't know what you're doing. Otherwise, you might get messed up colors. And then your depth, I would put that to 16 bits per channel. That we're getting the most color information, although they will take up a lot more space. Once you have this as TIFF, sRGB, 16 bits, the only thing left is to find a folder. And in my case, I created a new one called Comet. We'll save it in there. And then just hit save, and it'll go through, save all your images. Once it's complete, you won't see any more photos remaining down here in the lower left. And you can click done in the lower right once it's gone through and saved all those images. From here, normally you would have multiple different ways to go. You could try stacking in Deep Sky Stacker or Starry Sky Stacker or Sequitur. However, this would be the one time I tell you don't even bother with any of that. And let me show you why. Okay, here is a photo that was stacked in Sequitur. If I zoom in, look at that nightmare. It just looks like a pixelated mess. I mean, the stars were stacked properly, but the comet, it's just, a, it's a waste of time. And that was using Sequitur. So I said, okay, maybe it's just something weird with the software. I'll try Deep Sky Stacker next. And when I used Deep Sky Stacker, it looked pretty good from out here. But when I zoomed in, we had the same problem, more or less. And this is why I don't recommend even wasting time trying to stack it. After doing a little bit more research, I did realize why both of those images look terrible. That's because of the stacking mode that I was using. If we go back to Sequitur real quick, what I was doing was changing the blend mode to select best pixels, which is sigma clipping average for those of you who know what that is. Basically it throws out things that don't belong and keeps the data that should be there. But in this case, the comet is kind of like a wild card and it didn't know how to handle it. So rather than using select best pixels, which is the common method, if you use accumulation, here in Sequitur, that will work much better, although it will keep all the planes and satellites still in the frame. And if you're using Deep Sky Stacker or one of the other softwares, the big thing is that you don't use the Sigma Clipping Average method. That seems to be the culprit. And here is the result I got using Sequitur with the accumulation, which is the default. 
you can see it's no longer pixelated, but the comet has clearly streaked out over the course of, you know, an hour's worth. So rather than using that full hour, I would have probably been better off using half of the amount. That way it's not nearly as wide and it doesn't look that great. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure I updated the video and gave you that information. If you want to follow my technique, open up Photoshop and then go to File, Scripts, Load Files into Stack. What we're going to do is take all those files we just saved and load them up in the same workspace by using this method. So again, that's File, Scripts, Load Files into Stack. Those will bring up a pop-up window. And from here, we're going to click on Browse. Now you want to find your folder with all those common images we saved earlier. And you could take as many or as few as you want. Usually the more the better though. And I think I will just select all of them today. So there we go. Then I'll hit OK. Now that we see this full list of images, normally what you'd want to do is hit attempt to automatically align source images. However, I can almost guarantee you that's not going to work. So don't even bother wasting your time with that. Just hit OK once you've loaded in all of your TIFFs. And then it's going to go through and load these all up as separate layers in the same workspace. Now that Photoshop has loaded in all of my photos as separate layers, we can continue on with the workflow. So you want to make sure you have the same scenario where you have all of your images sequentially lined up right here. And what you want to do is turn off all the eyeballs. So you just click on the top one, if they're selected anyway, click and drag down with your mouse and you can automatically turn them all off just by holding down. There we go. And I'm going to click the eyeball on the very bottom image. So you see that I very quickly turned everything off. And we're going to start here at the very bottom. Now what we're going to do, once we have the bottom eyeballs turned on, we're going to click up one layer, turn that eyeball on next. So all we've done is we have our bottom layer and the one above it turned on. From here, click where it says normal. These are our blending modes. Change it from normal to difference a good portion of the way down. Once you change it to difference, you can zoom in. Then you want to use the arrow keys on your keyboard to move the image up or down or left or right. And if it's not doing anything, make sure you click on the move tool. Also hit the escape key just to make sure nothing's selected and try it again. Now when you use the arrow keys, see how the stars are moving around? What you want to do is get to the point where you don't see anything at all like that. That means the images have been aligned as best as possible anyway. Again, what you don't want to see is any like white things like that, which are the stars. So there we go. I've now aligned the bottom two photos. From here, I'll change the blending mode from difference back to normal. And then we'll repeat that process. I'll click on the layer above it. I'll click on the eyeball to turn it on. I'll change the blending mode from normal to difference. And then I'll hit the escape key. That way this box is no longer blue and selected. So I'll hit escape, use my arrow keys to move the stars around again until they line up and disappear. Then change the blending mode back from normal or rather from difference to normal. And then we'll go back to the next layer on top, turn it on, go from normal to difference, Hit the escape key, use your arrow keys to move it around until everything disappears. Change it from difference to normal. You get the idea. Go one by one until you've lined up all the photos manually. And I know some of you are thinking, this is so much work, why don't I just use the stacking software that I've been using? You definitely can, but just watch out you don't get the pixelated comment which I showed you earlier. Again, the main culprit as far as I can tell is that Sigma clipping average stacking method. If you don't use that, it might work a lot better. Today though, I wanted to show you an alternate way to do things entirely with Photoshop. So by doing it manually ourselves, we're in complete control. And I'm gonna cut through the rest of this, that way I'm not wasting your time. But just keep following that process, click on the next layer up, turn on the eyeball, change the blending mode from normal to difference, hit the escape key, and then use your arrow keys to move it like so. 
change it from difference to normal. I'm not going to show you it again. You get the idea by now. If not, go back and rewatch it. Once I've done this to every single layer though, then we can continue on with the workflow. Well, that took a little bit longer than I would have liked, but at least it's done. So now I can zoom out. And before we continue on with the workflow, it's not a bad idea. If you have your top layer selected, hold down the shift key, click on your bottom layer. That way they're all highlighted. Now change the blending mode from normal to, you could do light and you can do difference again, but light is probably your best bet. And then zoom in and you'll see if everything lined up properly. In my case, we still have some significant drift, which tells me that I might have screwed something up along the way, or it just could have been the fact that, you know, what most likely was going on is I was only looking down here when I lined my images. And up top, things drifted much more substantially. So this is one of the downsides of using Photoshop for this process, but like I said, the end result's still gonna be a lot better than we would have gotten using deep sky stagger. We're also getting rid of all the planes and satellites and things like that. And of course the comet did move over the course of that time frame. So maybe rather than using all of these photos, which was over an hour's worth of total exposure time, I think I can turn off a bunch of them. See that how the comet just got smaller. If I turn off even more, see that comma got even smaller. So you could do that if you'd like and only do a handful of shots. This is up to you to experiment with, but I'm just gonna do the full amount and we'll see what happens. So there we go. Now, once you have all of your layers ready, make sure you change the blending mode. If you put it to lighten, put it back to normal. So with all your layers selected, I'm gonna change it back from lighten to normal. Now here's where the trick comes in. Again, all we've done at this point is we've manually lined up every single one of our photos. Now with all of our layers selected, we're gonna right click on any one and hit convert to smart object. Once we convert this to a smart object, we can do our stacking process here in Photoshop. Once that process finally completes, you should just have a single layer with a little tiny icon, which represents that this is a smart object. Now in my case, the first time I tried to do this, it actually crashed because I'm running really low on computer space on this laptop. I never have any free space on here. Uh, and what happened was it got all the way down. I had like zero gigs free. And then it just said, hey, I'm out of space. I can't do anything. And it reverted back in Photoshop. It couldn't complete the convert to smart object. In other words, if you have problems here, either clear out some stuff on your computer, just delete it, or go back to the first part of the workflow and rather than saving these as 16-bit TIFF files, save them as 8-bit TIFF files or even JPEGs. That way your computer can actually handle it. That's gonna be especially important if you're working on an older computer that doesn't have a lot of RAM or a solid state drive. Even on a fairly powerful laptop, it almost crashed it just because I didn't have that much space. But hopefully you don't have any trouble here when you convert the thing to smart object. Now, once we have this smart object, all we have to do is go to layer, smart objects, stack mode. And there's a lot of different options you can choose. Today, I'm gonna go with median and it should average out all of the junk basically in the photo, including the grain, some of the color model, the hot pixels, the planes and everything else. So let's try for median. Again, this might take a little while depending on your computer. But once it finishes, we can do before and after and see just how well it worked. And there we go, it is now done. The stacking essentially and removed all the junk from the photo. You'll notice the plane is no longer there. The best way to see how well that worked though is to zoom in, probably towards the core of the comet, and then we'll do our before and after. So if you go up to your history window, if you don't have this, you can always go up to window, choose history and it'll show up somewhere. Uh, but the way the history works is all you have to do is click above rendering image stack median. So I'll click convert to smart object. And now we see our before and after. So see how before is kind of grainy and after it's a little bit smoother. The color balance changed too, but we can always fix that later. So just in terms of the grain, it's already looking quite a bit better. 
And I actually had to remove some of those photos because, like I said, my computer almost crashed. So this is only working with probably a quarter of the image originally intended. Now let's look up here. Remember how the stars were all blurred out when I did that light and blend mode thing? Now they look fine. And one of the big problems you're going to notice very often when you're doing astrophotography is that you have a lot of this ugly color model. See how it's like splotchy, it's greens and blues and purples. It looks really ugly. But using this technique that I showed you today, we can pretty effectively remove it because of the fact that we had to manually move every single one of those frames using the arrow keys that helped to smooth out all these splotches because maybe we had a red splotch over a green splotch and it canceled it out and overall just smooths out the image when you take multiple photos, align them and uh, yeah, I think it looks a lot better. So there we go. And that was, like I said, probably 10 two minute photos. So what, 20 minutes worth? Not bad. Now we're ready to put the final touches on the image. The first thing I'm actually going to do is crop it just a little bit. So if I hit my crop tool, I want to verify that delete crop pixels is turned off. There's not a check here. That way I can always come back and recrop it. I won't lose anything. And then for the ratio, I'm going to put it to original ratio on the drop down. And now all I have to do is click and drag in the corners a little bit. Move it around. I think that's going to work for us. From here, you can take the image any direction you want. But I'm going to keep it simple for you guys today. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to right click on my layer here and hit rasterize layer. That's going to flatten the image and it should speed up the processing overall. I'd only recommend rasterizing this though after you've zoomed in and verified you don't have any artifacts or the stars aren't blurry or anything else. This is kind of like a destructive workflow from here on. So it's always a good idea to verify things look good. Now that we've rasterized our smart object, we've flattened it basically, I want to right click on my layer here and duplicate it. Once I've duplicated my layer, I'm going to go to filter, camera raw filter. It's up near, near the top there. Once you go to filter, camera raw filter, you're going to be right back kind of where we st were at the start of the workflow. This is a very simple way to edit your image. Maybe you want to make the image a little bit cooler and add some saturation. Heck, we can even add more contrast. And then we can bring up or down the highlights. This is just a very easy, fast way to really take the image to a whole new level without having to know about curves and everything else. So for me, this is one of my favorite ways to just quickly edit an image. I think it looks pretty good right there, at least as a starting point. Then I can scroll down, zoom in, and if I notice that there's still some grain, now would be a good time to fix it. If I go to the detail tab, I can move the noise reduction slider up until the grain smooths out. In this case, around 15. You don't need to do this step, but sometimes it helps. Just don't overdo it here. In my case, 15 is more than enough on my noise reduction slider in the detail tab. And this is using the latest 2020 update for camera raw, which I personally don't like. The old, the old layout was a little bit different and I think it was easier to follow along with, but moving right along, if you still add some vignette, you can try and fix it right now manually under the optics tab, which we have down here. So if you bring the vignette slider up, you'll get, you'll add uh, some brightness to the corners. If you bring it down, you'll add some darkness. I'm personally just going to leave everything at zero. I'm going to worry about that later. And this was just a very simple way, again, to do some basic edits. So I'll hit OK. You could get a lot more advanced using curves and levels and everything else. But there's our before and after. And they did a nice job. What I want to try now is adding a curves layer, clicking on the hand tool. And this is something we cover a lot in the deep space course. But once you have the hand tool selected here in your curves, we can zoom in, click with our mouse and drag it upwards to make this area brighter. Then we can say, hey, this needs to be darker. So I'll click, drag down with my mouse, make it darker. And if you look over here on the right, all we did is place some points, but we did those 
points by clicking on the actual image. So this is a very precise way to edit the contrast in your photo. And I think that did a really nice job of bringing out the comet even more. In this case, I'm really not liking the air glow too much. I think it's distracting from the comet, but that's the weather conditions I had this night. So there's not too much I can do about it, unfortunately. Moving on, I'm gonna add a selective color. Again, these are all found on the adjustments tab. If you don't have the adjustments tab, you can go up to window and adjustments. And if you do get my deep space course or my astro photography post-processing course, we cover all this. We cover the basics. We cover how to light, lay everything out like I have here. And we cover some really advanced techniques for blending and everything else. So I'd recommend if you want to learn more, uh, check out both of those courses on my website. But again, selective color is right here, bottom row, second from the right. And with selective color, maybe I can go to the green color channel and say, hey, I want to make those maybe not as noticeable. So now they're a lot more noticeable. You get the idea, I can turn them down a little bit. And then I can go to the blue color channel right here. And now I can really make that blue streak stand out, or I can even make it purple if I wanted to. But I really like that blue color. So I'm gonna use these sliders to make it stand out. The problem is, it's affecting the entire photo. I only wanted to affect the tail. And one way I can do that is with my layer mask. So right now you'll see the layer mask is completely white. If I hit Control or Command I though, for invert, I've now made it completely black. I've turned off essentially this layer. So using a white paint brush, I can paint in the layer right where I want it, which is on this blue tail. If you don't understand layer masks, again, I'd recommend, uh, there's plenty of videos here on YouTube that'll get you up to speed, to be honest. But there we go, all I do is I put white on a black layer mask, white turned on this effect just where I wanted it, black turned it off. The only thing left is to go to filter, blur, Gaussian blur, zoom out. And originally it was really precise and it would look fake if I did that. So if I blur it out, it's a lot more subtle now. And there we go, just a very subtle increase on the blues nobody would ever even really know except for me. From here, you know, you, like I said, you can take this in any direction you want. I'm still not liking the corners. I think that vignette correction could have been a little bit better, and that's probably why a lot of people recommend taking flat frames. That'll help to smooth that out. And to be honest, with this particular lens, I think I probably should because the vignette just never really goes the way I'd like it to. But one thing I could try is using Raya Pro. That's R-A-Y-A Pro. This is from Jimmy McIntyre. Uh, he makes a lot of really good plugins for Photoshop, and I love using them. That's what I use for a lot of my blending and things like that. So I'd recommend checking it out. He's got a lot of great YouTube videos as well. I'd recommend if you want to learn more about editing. But in Raya Pro, I can just add a little vignette. And that's at least a more uniform vignette now rather than that kind of random one from before. So there we go. It's kind of heavy but I can always turn it down later. Yeah, see how before there's some light pollution down here and it was kind of like ruining the focus of the image, but with the vignette, now your eye goes right to the comet. So for me, sometimes vignette's actually a good thing, but I can always turn down the opacity from 100 to maybe 70. I think mean, it looks good there. Yeah, I think that turned out pretty well, all things considered. So hopefully now, you understand a little bit better how to take and edit your photo of the comet. The big thing here is using a star tracker that way you can shoot long exposures without star trails. If you didn't have a tracker, you can shoot probably more than one or two seconds before you got star trails, maybe four seconds at the most. But in this case, I shot two minutes and my stars were still sharp after two minutes. Then we used Photoshop to stack all those images together because all the other stacking uh, applications were having problems for some reason. And if you'd like to learn more, I'd always recommend checking out either my Patreon or one of my courses on my website. There's tons and tons of content out there that'll get you up to speed on both wide-angle Milky Way photography and deep space astrophotography. So that's all I got for you today. Hopefully you can go out 
If you can get up on the night of the 19th or the 20th, the 21st, that's going to be your best bet for photographing this comet. Just look in the northwest sky below the Big Dipper after sunset, and you should see it. And you can hopefully get your own really amazing photos of this comet.